Everybody, thank you, um, truly. Uh, grateful for uh, everyone coming together um, on very short notice um, and engaging in this conversation, which is obviously uh, critically important. And um, I, I think from my perspective here, um, uh, urgent and necessary, and what I hope to have out of this is a conversation, um, is an opportunity for me to, um, to listen to some of the most prominent leaders of uh, our community here in Massachusetts um, about um, what I can do um, and about how I can be uh, of service and how I can be helpful. I am <clears throat> sure like so many over the course of the last two days, um, woke up, looked at the newspaper, turned on the news and have just been horrified um, and heartbroken and angry and um, understanding that this has <laughs> happened over and over and over again in our country somehow still cannot seem to progress through it. And I know you all obviously live that experience more so than I do. Um, and so I, um, I welcome your perspective and your suggestions and um, any words of wisdom that you have about um, ways in which I can be uh, of service and, and helpful. And we got an incredible group of folks um, here to lead this conversation, obviously with Sheriff Tompkins and with uh, Michael Curry and with Rasan Hall. Um, and um, I just I very much look forward to the conversation. So um, thank you all. And Sheriff, I'll kick it over to you. Thank you so much for the conversation uh, and the gathering, frankly. Um, coming from the standpoint of law enforcement, uh, I am passionate about the fact that we need to comport ourselves uh, a lot differently than we have in the past. Um, I've, been, uh, I've been telling folks when they ask me, do we have a broken criminal justice system? And my, my retort is that I don't think it's broken. I think it was set up to be as punitive as it is for a variety of reasons. And I'm, I'm not saying it was just set up to be punitive towards folk of color, but it's been set up that way. So it's not broken. Um, and does it need to be fixed? It needs to be overhauled. It needs a, a I believe, a, a, a complete cleansing, you know? And so this conversation gives us an opportunity uh, to chat with you about some of the um, systemic inequities uh, that we're experiencing in this country and how we work collaboratively, collectively, um, no matter the color of your skin, to remedy this situation. And so with that said, I want, I want to go to um, uh, Rasan Hall first. I'm going to ask all three of you this question. I want to start with Rasan. And this question is, Rasan, how do we change the consciousness of this nation? That's a big question. Um, <laughs> uh, first, thank you, Congressman, for having this conversation and making yourself available uh, to this. And uh, Sheriff Tompkins, I appreciate you reaching out uh, for me to be in this conversation. And, um, you know, changing the consciousness of this nation requires a reckoning with the truth and the history uh, of this nation, that it is one that is built off of the genocide and murder and theft uh, of native peoples and their land and the forced labor of African people um, brought here from the continent. And, and, and then that there was uh, significant wealth that was created off of the backs of murdered people and stolen land and forced labor. Uh, and that it wasn't just a, a single incident or moment in time uh, but it is a part of the fabric that runs through the tapestry that is this nation. And until there is a, a reconciliation of that history in this country, um, we're not going to be able to really change the consciousness of this country. I think when we see instances of police killings like the murder of George Floyd, um, it, it's as infuriating and as enraging as it is, it's, it's nothing new. Um, and so the protests and uprisings that, have, that we've seen in various cities throughout the country are not just a protest of police killings. That is what is the tipping point. 
uh, but it sits atop of uh, uh, a mound of, of of oppression. We've just come off of, or we are just in, the, we are still in the midst of uh, grossly disproportionate uh, death rates due to COVID-19. We are experiencing the exacerbation of education gaps that are going to become worse because of the technological gap. Uh, we think about wealth and economic disparity and the fragility of Black businesses that are going to be hit uh, even worse and rapid gentrification in our communities. These aren't all just isolated incidents. These just aren't the acts of a few bad apples that have led to this, but this is uh, the manifestation of centuries of structural racism and white supremacy. And until there's an honest conversation and a reckoning with that, it will be difficult to change the consciousness of this country. So Michael, um, um, I'm sorry, Congressman, were you about to say something? I'm sorry. I was just gonna ask the next step, and I, I just wanna hear from Michael on that too, but what, uh, Rosanna, I, I am um, <clears throat> conscious of the fact that I obviously went, <laughs> went through high school and college and even graduate school, um, know the major points of our country's history was taught through high school and college, the, and even took a class on the Civil War. The message that you just delivered was not the one that was crisply delivered as part of those teachings through my own education, right? Um, the historical pieces, yes. Battle of Shiloh, um, you know, Gettysburg, um, Emancipation Proclamation, Slavery, Civil Rights Act, Reconstruction, Civil Rights Act, et cetera. But I don't recall the study of American history dwelling on the <clears throat> appropriation, aggregation, the appropriation of literally human beings. I mean, yes, and understanding what slavery was, but the growth of wealth and aggregation of wealth that came with that and the way in which that persists through this day, right? And I think there's an emerging understanding of that now, but that's, that wasn't, and that might've been a failure of my own education system, but that wasn't the overall narrative there. And I don't think I'm unique in that. Yeah, not at all. I mean, and I think that's, that's the problem that we face with how history is taught with how slavery and the civil rights movement is taught. I think that's one of the things that was the most powerful about the 1619 project mm -hmm. because it begins to create a new narrative and reframe our understanding of, of history and, the, and America's um, um, infatuation with uh, the oppression of black bodies um, and, and how it ties into who this country is today, that it is not a distant, uh, memory of a time long forgotten, but that it is very present with us uh, even now. So Michael, if in fact the country needs a change in its consciousness, um, let's just, I'd, I'd like you to touch on what our elected officials can do to foster that change in consciousness. Uh, how, how incredibly impactful is the words of our legislators, the people that we vote into office, we send to the respective state houses to do the people's business. How do they change America's consciousness around the inequities, the economic, the racial inequities, and all of the other isms? Um, thank you, Sheriff. And, and I'll follow Has uh, Rasan by saying thank you to you for hosting, being a part of this conversation and to um, uh, also a friend, uh, Congressman Kennedy, who I've known a long time in the healthcare space, huge champion for community health centers and all the work that he does around health equity. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for your, your work in that, on that, in, in that level. Um, we we'll also want to uh, recognize Rasan Hall, who I think, Steve, you couldn't have asked a better person to answer that question. That initial question to Rasan, who studied it, who spends his life working on these issues of equity and justice. Um, you know, I, I'd probably start here by saying uh, this first. Um, it, it takes time for truth to catch up to history, uh, to the Congressman's earlier point. Um, there's an African proverb that I love that says, um, hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. 
and I want to repeat that, hunters will cease being heroes when lions have historians. Um, we've not had enough of our historians telling the true story about America. Um, when I talk to my, my many white friends and some African-American friends and others, they don't know the impact of slavery. They don't know what 40 acres and a mule was all about and, 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 and uh, reparations, that campaign that started right after the end of slavery. They have no idea uh, the Homestead Act and the Southern Homestead Act. They have no idea all those developments in our history that explain where we are today as African-American people. So when you talk about housing insecurity, when you talk about education inequities, when you talk about disparities in healthcare, uh, you can clearly draw lines in history to where we are as a people and where we are as a country. I often make the comparison to a family. We are a dysfunctional family with abuse, neglect in our household. And similar to a family, we sit down maybe at a table once in a while, but we don't have a conversation and we're not addressing the underlying issue around how we got here. So what happens, right? We fight, uh, there's conflict in the home. Um, there is a depression and sickness in the home that is a direct result of the fact that we've never dealt with the underlying issue that someone's been abused in that family. Uh, and some family members wanna say, just get over it. <laughs> we don't need to talk about it. Let's rewrite history around what happened to you in this household. I think that's where we are as a country. We have not acknowledged that it's no accident that African-Americans are in a the condition they're in. There's no, 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 no shock that, I, that Native Americans and many Latinos are in the situations we're in. And until we reconcile with that history, we'll always end up uh, with a riot. We'll always end up with this conflict. So to answer your question, Steve, here's where elected officials come in. Uh, we need elected officials to be bold and tell the truth. We need elected officials. I used to say this when I was NAACP president in Boston. I say this now that I'm on the national board at NAACP. I really don't wanna sit down with a mayor or a state rep or a congressman or a senator or a president who doesn't have that basic understanding of history because then it's a deficit in the conversation. Then I gotta explain to you what inequity is. Then I gotta walk you through why it's not just about pulling our pants up and not eating pork and we gotta stop looting our communities. You'll have a context for the conversation and then we can move it forward and talk about real policy. But the problem is no one wants to have that conversation. People are afraid to have that conversation because there's guilt that comes with that. You don't want to own that guilt. You don't want to, you don't have that responsibility. The more I know, the more I have a responsibility to do, right? That's the challenge. I, and I'll say this really quickly, Steve. I make the comparison to the little kid. I always say the little white kid in the movie Sixth Sense with Bruce Willis. Have you ever seen that movie? And the classic line from that movie is, I see dead people. I use that analogy for race. That little kid did not want to face the fact that he saw dead people because if he saw them, he'd have to listen. If he saw them and he recognized them, he'd have to respond to their calls to help them. That's race in America. People don't want to pay attention because if they pay attention, then they have the obligation, the responsibility to teach differently, to police differently, to deal with our penal system differently, to be guidance counselors differently to lead differently, and it, it comes with tremendous responsibility, so it's easier to not pay attention, to not tell the truth. So elected officials, um, I, I often balk at this conversation about black agenda, because it's not like this is new. You know, I'm a student of history, and I'm a student of people like Mel King and Mahmoud El Khati, the history professor, who's the equivalent of Mel King in Minneapolis right now. He was my mentor when I was at McAllister College in St. Paul. He would say to me, Mike, don't think that you walked in and all of a sudden the solutions came up. They were here before you. <laughs> no one just picked up the solution and acted on it. So it's no, it's no newness around predatory lending and what we need to do to make sure people have homes to build wealth. There's no new conversation to how to stop killing people. The fact that we need no, more diversity in law enforcement, we need more accountability. We need to have less white men and more others. And we need to make sure that when there's bad cops, unions can't protect them and they're ousted immediately. You're decertified, unlicensed, you can't carry a gun, and we don't want you in any law enforcement. We need to deal with veterans' preference and the fact that you can pipeline from the military right into these law enforcement jobs, from the FBI down to local police departments, and there's no diversity in that pipeline. There's, there's no newness to this. Rasan's been dealing with this for years. Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, ACLU, NAACP, 
um, legal defense fund. There's no newness in this. People just got to go and dig out the books that have been put together on how to deal with this issue and actually have the courage to, I'll quote D.A. Rollins. She says, we need people with courage and character to do what they, what's necessary. That's where we are. So, Congressman, um, what I'd like to ask is the same question to you about how do we change consciousness, but I would also like you to touch on legacy. And what I mean by that is family legacy, community legacy, uh, and, 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 and country legacy. And so 50 years from now, 100 years from now, what, will, what would we like to uh, have people talk about when they talk about the explosion in 2020 and how that consciousness and that legacy has been changed for the better? <clears throat> Sheriff, I think, um, I think the first goal there is to make sure that 100 years from now we are talking about 2020 as that inflection point right and that we're talking about it as saying it it, it took this but here was that inflection um <clears throat> and it's awfully hard to follow up um Rasan's answer to my question and then <clears throat> excuse me michael's answer to that last question um but i think what has to happen out of that and, and building off of Michael, how you finished that um, about, about courage and character is to recognize and what Rasan said, the, um, the falsities and exaggerations of our own narrative <clears throat> and the fact that um, we have <clears throat> uh, current economic system and, and political system that continues to um, succeed off of, um, to generate wealth and power um, off of the subjugation of others. Um, and um, predominantly um, black and brown people. And I think what that means is, you know, I look around our, um, the House of Representatives, it's the most diverse Democratic caucus in history. And I think it's something to be very proud of. Um, <clears throat> but I think um, as a body, Congress, the House, the Senate, the presidency, um, and the various chambers around the country have a long way to go. And I think um, there has to be a greater understanding um, through members um, and through active participants here um, about the ways in which the, um, the ways in which the roles that we currently occupy play in it and perpetuate it. Um, and, you know, it's not enough to think that um, one is an ally to the folks that are being um, suppressed and oppressed in this. Uh, if you're not asking members of those communities how you can help. Um, and if you're not trying to understand what allyship means from their eyes and their perspective, if they don't have a seat at the table and if those voices aren't heard. And I think that means for those of us, look, I, I'm a, obviously a, a white guy born to an incredible privilege. Um, but even my knowledge of <clears throat> our history and my family's role in it and all the rest of it. Um, there is not, um, that does not pale to um, the experience of an African-American male in our society today. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say on this, um, for all of my education and all of the, the teachings that I've had, probably the most powerful um, series of conversations on a race I had was with a law school classmate. We were um, uh, roommates for uh, a trip to um, to Ghana of all places for about a month, uh, three weeks or so. Um, and um, he was a strong built kid, um, an athlete. And we were during the course of that trip, we went down to Cape Coast. Um, and 
we had a series of conversations about um, just he and I about race. Um, and candidly, one of those, you know, it was an incredible grace and patience on his part where I could ask some of those questions that I never felt comfortable asking in a broader group. Um, and he was kind enough to answer them. And I think what that exposed more than anything is, you know, the recognition that what this moment exposes is it's not on people of color to try to teach everybody else about the failures of this system, right? That's not on, it's not on you all to try to teach it about me. It's about on those that are in a position of power to fix it, to understand it and do something about it. And I think we have a long way to go to address that. So, so Congressman, we have this issue mm -hmm. that's over in Minnesota with the unfortunate death of Mr. Floyd. And I've been asked a number of times about the difference between the charge, third degree versus first degree. Um, can you enlighten folk that will see this as to the difference of a third degree charge versus a first degree charge? Huh. Um. Sure, if I um, was just looking into some of the, the legal standards in that doctrine uh, a moment ago, and I can't profess to have fully understood the details of it, but um, the big disparity there comes to intent. Um, and I think that's the piece that, again, on a quick glance, I think many of us wrestle with, which is, um, I mean, a lot that we wrestle with over the course of what we've seen, right? I was a prosecutor. People got arrested for probable cause all the time. And every now and again, you'd sit there and as a prosecutor, I'd sit there and be like, there's not enough to sustain this arrest, to sustain a, a case. We have to dismiss the charges. Might've been PC for an arrest, but there's not, there's not sufficient evidence to actually mount a trial. And so therefore I can dismiss it. And the system to an extent is actually designed that way. There was more than enough PC to arrest that officer way early on. And there's plenty of instances for black and brown folks that have been arrested first before somebody does that full investigation. We, you see that every day in our criminal justice system. You see it too. Um, so I think that was one thing. But with regards to the charge, um, one, all of them should be charged, uh, all of those officers. Two, um, hard to understand how uh, on an initial charge, why you would, why the prosecutors would start with a lower understanding of intent, right? That officer sat on a man's neck, knelt on a man's neck for nine minutes. Well, he said, I can't breathe, then stop talking, then stop moving. There's an awful lot of intent that can be afforded out of those actions. Um, and the idea that we would start, as you know, as you all know, those charges, you don't often up those charges. You normally start higher and reduce. Um, and so the fact that a prosecutor started there, um, I think does lead to some pretty serious questions. Larry Tribe has an op-ed that just went up um, today, uh, also calling into question very much the intent notion here because, uh, and arguing that those charges might be dismissed because the charges themselves are in fact legally do not fit this moment or the facts. And if those charges are dismissed because they don't fit, why was it that those charges were the ones that were um, filed in the first place? Rashawn, um, from your perch at the ACLU, can you follow the congressman's comments on the third degree versus first degree cha um, um, uh, charge, uh, if you see it any differently? No, I, you know, as a former state prosecutor myself, um, the congressman's point about probable cause, um, it's, it's such a low standard. Um, you know, presenting cases before a grand jury, it, th there's a saying you can indict a ham sandwich. <laughs> I mean, there is a body of jurors who are sitting there. They're not really asking many questions. It's a secret proceeding. There's no obligation to put, uh, uh, uh yeah, um, contested, uh, witnesses before the before the grand jury, there's certainly an obligation uh, to provide known exculpatory evidence. Um, but, you know, 
the determination of whether or not something is exculpatory is within the hands of the prosecutor at the time. Um, and rare, you know, it's those rare instances where defense attorneys find out about it after that something happens where there is a motion for new trial, uh, but there's no consequence for the prosecutors in doing that. And so it, it, I think one of the bigger problems um, and this may have, and I don't know for certain, but this may have informed the prosecutors there thinking uh, about what charges to bring is, you know, what are the defenses going to be? You know, was this officer's actions, could they be perceived as reasonable within the scope of their duty? And, you know, clearly from a layperson's perspective and from, you know, and from many lawyers, they'll say, no, it, it absolutely, uh, was not a, a reasonable approach uh, to take, to, to use that level of force. But the way that the law has been interpreted over time, it has granted greater and greater privilege uh, to law enforcement to conduct themselves in a way that if they have a reasonable fear that um, the things that they are doing are necessary to prevent you know, someone from hurting them or hurting someone else in the community, that they can exercise a level of force in proportion to what they believe the threat to be. And if they're saying this person was resisting arrest and we had to sus subdue him, um, then that's what they're going to um, uh, use as the justification for charging a lower uh, uh, standard of, of murder, right? Because they're what is the evidence that this officer had in his mind the the premeditation to take this man's life from a legal standard, not from what we kind of colloquially and commonly understand um, uh, when you see somebody choke somebody out, uh, but in the context of an officer doing their job. Uh, you know, I don't agree with it. Uh, I, I think they should have been charged with the officer should have been charged with first degree murder. Um, but, the, you know, but there's also the larger question and concern around qualified immunity, uh, which protects officers and gives them the ability to conduct themselves uh, in this way. Um, Jaquetta, I'm going to come to you in a second, but I want to ask uh, Michael Curry first. Mike, so we see after this incident, um, all types of protests. Uh, going on that's raging throughout the country. Um, some um, confrontational, some not as confrontational. Do you think that the um, fires and possible um, property destruction takes away from the larger message that the protesters are trying to come forth with, talking about and addressing um, the inequities, uh, some of the inequities in our society? You know, it's funny. Uh, we've been having a lot of these conversations about violence in America uh, and the uh, misrepresentation that it's only black people when they're oppressed, when they're angry that uh, loot, rob and burn things. Um, aside from the issue that there clearly seems to be outside agitators who are taking advantage of this moment. Um, I know there's black folks who would throw a garbage can through a window. Steve, you and I would, re you know, reflect back on do the right thing. Right, Raheem, right. And, and that anger we've all felt at times to get the attention that we think it deserves, right? It's demanding America's attention to issues that we've been trying to work legitimately through our legal systems, through our legislative systems, through our administrative systems to get uh, redressed, to get some response, and we've not received it. We've, we've done the marching and praying thing, right? And I think there is, and, and, and it's only pockets of us who get so overwhelmed that it turns into demanding that you pay attention. So I'm gonna burn down your building. I'm gonna throw a garbage can through your window. Um, and I think we need to realize that's as American as apple pie. Mm. Um, you know, I always point to uh, what they call Boston's righteous mob with the American Revolution, right? Mm. These were white folks throwing stuff and burning stuff. Right. We know that throughout American history, the Civil War, the Southern the Southern folks were upset about the ending of slavery way before we got to the point that we had a war. There was protests. There was civil civil unrest based on those those actions. So we know and you can move it forward to even things that aren't even as serious like championships. When you look at these campuses and folks are burning and turning over cars and and doing stuff that we would all view. I just want to take it out of this false perception that it's only black folks. And guess what? We ain't doing it because we won a championship. 
Um, we're not doing it because we don't want to wear a mask. We're doing it because a man died. A man's life was taken. That we keep thinking that this constitution applies to us. And then we keep being told, we keep getting gaslighted and saying, okay, and I remember arguing this, you know, Congressman, we need body cameras. I used to tell brothers in the hood, like, yeah, we need body cameras because when we get body cameras, we can prove it. And brothers are like, yo, you crazy. They still ain't going to do shit about it. That's what they used to tell me. They still ain't going to do shit even when they see it. And I would say to you, Congressman, and you, Sheriff, here's, here's where we are. The reality is we're getting gaslighted now. We're getting told, you know what? You really didn't see what you thought you saw when the cop shot him in the back running. You really didn't see what you thought you saw when that 12-year-old boy was playing in the park and they pulled up just feet away from him and shot him playing with a toy gun like we all did as little kids. You really didn't see what you thought you saw in that Walmart when they shot that man standing in Walmart, right? I can go down the list. And then we say to ourselves, wow, you know, witnesses, videotape, we really did, that's being gaslighted. We're being lied to. And that's what power and privilege gives you. That's what Donald Trump mm -hmm. does, masterfully. He can say something and do something and 40% of this population will go, you know what, that ain't quite what he said. It ain't what you said. What you saw is not what it really was. This is what law enforcement in America has been doing to black people for many, for all of our existence in this country. And that's what's playing out here, Steve. We have a situation where we're not demanding that now that we have this video, and I'll use a Latin term, which, which all of you'll know, and I've used it loosely, but you'll, you learn it in law school, but I went to a Latin school, race ipsa loquitur. The thing speaks for itself. Right. We know that if you see a man put his knee on another man's neck for eight to 10 minutes and literally take the life out of him, there was animus in that. There was an intent in that. He, he had people appealing to him to let him up, to let him breathe. He had the man begging him to let him breathe and he chose to kill him. But yet we're about being gaslighted to believe, well, maybe he was drunk. Maybe he might have been doing drugs. And then now maybe he had underlying health conditions. I don't care if he had cancer, lupus, um, asthma. The reality is the, the death of that man was caused by the knee on his neck. So I say to you, Steve, we're sick and tired. You know, I saw a young sister, the Minneapolis NAACP president said that the other day. She said, we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Now, the problem with this is, and Rasan and I have been there, after all of these murders, murders, is we gather in the hundreds, the thousands, the tens of thousands, and then people fall right back into the same system that won't do shit to help these people, that won't do anything to change the systemic issues that led to these deaths, and that's what I'm concerned about. Because I'll be honest with you, I, I'm real moved about George Floyd's death. I'm real moved about um, Ahmaud Arbery's death, but nothing probably moved me more than Tamir Rice because I have sons. A little boy playing with guns. That was me running around in parks with a toy gun acting like I was playing cops and robbers. And we didn't do shit after he died. We didn't change a damn thing after he died. So I asked the question, if not, if not now, then when? Right, right. Uh, Jaquetta, you wanted to uh, chime in? and uh, ask a question or make a comment? I really don't want to follow Mike Curry, but, <laughs> but I will, I guess. Um, so I, I think um, I'd like to, to hear a little bit. Um, let me preface by saying, as a Black woman, um, I acknowledge that my walk um, is tough in this country, but it's not as tough as a Black man. And I think that when we have conversations about race, Black men are often dismissed as if, um, you know, there's, there's a, that, that their pain and trauma um, is what the entire community experiences. And the truth of the matter is it's not, and that's not fair to them. I think when we start talking about, you know, a black agenda, a brown agenda, um, and what we're asking people who are in uh, those buildings on Capitol Hill when they advocate for us, it's not only that we have a voice at the table, but that that voice can change. It's supposed to evolve. The 
experiences that we see today, and I, I talked to my parents who are both boomers, um, and they are re-experiencing trauma right now. They are looking at the TV and looking at the news, and they are beside themselves. My parents grew up in the segregated South, um, and even though my mother grew up in an upper-middle-class Black family, that did not save her from racism. And my father grew up, you know, blue, blue collar. He was a panther who became a cop. <laughs> he literally thinks that we are about to have a race war. And I think when we talk about the black and brown agenda and we talk about what that narrative needs to be, we need to, one, admit that it's going to change. The experiences that we saw in the 80s with race are not the same here. The foundation of it is, but they change because now we have a camera and, and we can, you know, videotape uh, the Amy Coopers of the world and the Derek Chauvin's of the world. So that matters, but it's not going to matter much if we just say, well, we want to talk to you and we want the black, black and brown agenda to be about these three issues and leave it alone. We need to continue to have this conversation. I'm glad Mike brought up uh, Do the Right Thing because if you even go back to old Richard Pryor albums, he talks about police brutality. So does Red Fox. This is not new for black men in this country. Um, Tamir Rice, yes. There was Emmett Till before that. There was Willie McGee before George Floyd. There's all these instances. Thomas Ship, Abram Smith. I can, you know, I live for black history. I can go all day and talk about all the names, but we need to talk about what that looks like when we're asking our white allies who are now advocating for us in ways that they should be, that that's an evolving conversation. And we not only need to hold them accountable, but we need to hold those accountable who look like us, who sit in those chairs right along white allies, and that they are either, they tend to be silent or they're not doing enough. Not all of them, but there are some up there. So I just wanted to say that. And I, I don't want to follow Mike Curry again. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hey, Steve, I don't know what she's talking about because I don't want to follow her because that was powerful. Was, was. <laughs> and let, me say, let me say this. We've got uh, about 20 minutes left, so I'm going to ask you to condense the answers um, of the questions, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, I'm looking at you, Rasan. okay? And, you know, I'm only kidding. Brother. I'm, a, I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. I just called you out because you were smiling. Let me ask this quick question with the short answer. And I'm going to go back to you first, Jaquetta. So uh, VP Biden has mentioned that his running mate is going to be a woman, of, a woman, not of color, but a woman. Do you think that that individual should have a law enforcement background? I'm going to ask all of you that. And if we can keep it a little brief because the clock is ticking on us. Let's start with you, Jaquetta. Um, yes, I do think that he or she should have um, a law enforcement background. I'm a little disappointed that I'm hearing people say, well, if he doesn't pick somebody black, I'm not going to vote. That is a vote for Trump on any level. We need to be very, very intentional about what we are going to do in November and in September. Also, I think that when we ask for this law enforcement background, that it needs to come from a place of empathy, that this person can say, listen, I wear a uniform and, or I've, I've, worked with people around, uh, that I've worked with people who are in uniforms, and that we need to have parameters set in place, and we need to have mental health um, facilities and resources for these people. They experience trauma, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but that is what we need. We need a new way to police. Okay, Mike, Rashawn, and then the congressman, same question. Should the VP have a law enforcement background, Michael? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I would require that. Like, I don't think that that, I, I could make an easy argument. I think the congressman could, could, would agree that if you really want to talk about death in this country, it's not by law enforcement. It's about public health system. It's in, it's in health care, right? We have more people dying unnecessarily of cancer, diabetes, and all these other heart conditions at a disparate rate, living five to 10 years less. And then you add on top of that, when a pandemic comes, we die in large numbers with the inequities that we're seeing playing out across the country. So I could argue the person should have a public health background, right? Or an economic development background because we really need somebody with a sense of that the in economic inequality that contributes to all these things we're talking about. Or I could say a housing background. I think ultimately, and I'm, I'm not being silly when I say this, I want somebody like Jaquetta. Like I want somebody who has a cross section of knowledge on all of our history, 
American history, how it's impacted black and brown folks in all of those spaces, so that when they enter that vice presidential position, they're pushing Biden. You know, now I'm gonna tell you, I'm a you know, I'm I'm gonna say I've been around Biden um, in the Obama administration. I work on the national NAACP, I've interacted with him and his team. Um, he's gonna require some pushing. Because quite frankly, he's not where we need him to be. And I agree with Jaquetta. A vote not for him is a vote for Trump. But I will tell you, we don't get all we want out of Biden either. So it's going to require somebody that he puts in that position to have somebody with a consciousness like Jaquetta that's going to say, no, brother, that's not what we're doing around criminal justice. We need to talk about decarceration. No, brother, that's not what we're doing when it comes to health care. You need to put more money into eliminating health disparities, not reducing them. And here's how you do it. So, so I, I, don't, I don't see it being criminal justice. I see it being a consciousness issue. So Mike, uh, before I go to Rashawn, um, how much did Joquetta give you to like pump her up like this, bro? <laughs> she didn't have to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna tell you consciousness matters and there's, in Boston, there's some amazing brothers and sisters. Um, and, and Rashawn is one of my, my favorite in his, in his world, Willie Bodrick. Uh, Jaquetta and Jaquetta comes out of that with her family. We need people like that to be in these seats. DA Rollins, I'm a fan of hers. Like she's ripping it right now and, and really calling people to task. Rashawn, do we need to have a VP candidate that has a law enforcement background? Absolutely not. That's part of the problem. People with law enforcement backgrounds, generally speaking, have an investment in believing that the work that they did was somehow valuable and that it added significance to the, our understanding of safety in society. I think part of the problem is the criminal legal system and the carceral infrastructure that we have in this country is too robust. And anyone with a law enforcement background is going to have a belief in the legitimacy of that very system. If we are to begin to tear down that system and abolish prisons and abolish police, and not just like, let's get rid of them and let everybody do whatever the hell they want, but create new systems so that people can be safe in their communities because we have the types of resources that we need in the communities. And to the extent that we need to restrain or incapacitate people, it's not in facilities where people are being caged and warehoused. And so I think the, the, the less likely someone is to believe in the legitimacy of that structure, they're more likely to have a, be able to envision a world where we can have alternative systems where we can still be safe because the right types of investments are being made in community. Congressman, uh, the same question to you, but just a variation on a the theme here. Um, should the VB candidate have a law enforcement background? And if not, what qualities should she, in this case, have to serve as a VP? Mr. Sheriff, I'm going to echo uh, Mr. Curry on this one. I think, <clears throat> look, I think any experience um, provides value, um, and particularly in some of the major structures of our society. Um, and um, do I think that there's, I think there's a, a breadth of experiences in, in law enforcement that um, can provide insights to some aspect of, uh, of that job. Uh, I do think that you know, understanding how the federal system inter, uh, interacts with a state system and particularly a criminal justice system interacts with a civil justice system, right? You get arrested for possession of marijuana now all of a sudden as a teenager and all of a sudden your mom you loses her affordable housing. That's a problem, right? And how all these pieces fit together. Um, so I think that's valuable. I do think, um, as you know, as Michael pointed out, um, healthcare has been a big focus of mine you address social determinants of health, we're going to do um, an awful lot to address some of the inequities in our society because of what that frame is going to force us to do. There is no justification in our country to see where neighborhoods that are adjoining zip codes that are predominantly white and predominantly black have a 20-year disparity on life expectancy. There's no justification for it. And if we actually start to tug at that and the drivers to that, um, that's, um, I think that would be enormously um, beneficial to addressing some of the other uh, equity issues we confront because it does, as we start to unpack that, it gets into so many other ones. And so um, I think somebody with a, that, um, that background would be valuable. And I do think that the broader issue there, I, I think Michael nailed it, is 
is consciousness, but also look, I think a humility, right? A humility to understand, particularly at that, at that level of government, that your perspective is not going to be complete, that what you bring to the table is not going to be wholly accurate and a desire to actually understand more and to know that you might come with framed perspectives, um, but that that doesn't mean that those are, should not be challenged or pushed or refuted. And that part of your job, particularly, I think, as a vice president is an advocate because let's be clear, you don't have a whole lot of other structured positions, structured responsibilities as vice president, other than perhaps stepping in to the most important job in the world. But it is then a question of how are you going to choose to use that advocacy and what are you going to push for? And I, I'm not sure there's a, a, I can't think of anything our country needs more at this moment than an advocate on these issues. Congressman, um, I believe that our democracy is under siege. If in fact that is the case, what is it that we as citizens of this country need to do to, um, to counter that and to keep intact uh, the good aspects of democracy and our democracy? If in fact you agree with me that our democracy is under siege. I think our democracy is uh, 100% under siege. Um, and I think there's essentially irrefutable evidence to show that. Um, you know, I think reminded of uh, a quote, it's not enough, it's not enough to allow dissent, we must demand it because there's much to dissent from. <laughs> At this point, <laughs> um, we need those voices, right? And we need, I think, at a national level, um, we need to have this convert this family conversation, as Michael put it, um, and acknowledge the fact that there's been, I think, for far too long to build on his metaphor, family members that just don't want to have it, um, and so gone up, walked away, been busy, whatever else, upstairs listening to music, um, and look, a lot of that is comes from, you know, my demographic and and um, my station. Um, and so what I think you're seeing is a community that's saying, hey, we're going we're gonna to force you to have that conversation. And what I think is incumbent on those of us that come at this with a particular um, level of privilege is to, to truly listen, to understand that, as both Rasana and Michael said earlier, that what we see taking place across our country now is a primal scream because you have tried every other possible option and you still have been denied. And the only thing I'll say to, to that as I close on this, um, Michael, when you, you mentioned that earlier, that that is as American a, a, a history as we have from the Boston Tea Party to, you know, at every other point, right? It's also in our founding documents, right? Like literally, right? It was the responsibility of our people, when a good government became destructive of those ends, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, when government became destructive of those ends, it was the responsibility of our people to alter or abolish it. That was the rationale for our nation. And, you know, if government is instituted among men to provide those three things, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, I think you can make a pretty strong constitutional case that there was no life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness for George Floyd. Breonna Taylor, Ramad Aubrey. And if that's the case, um, and our founders found the words to say, hey, your responsibility then is to actually alter that government, it puts these demonstrations in a bit of a context here that I'm not so sure um, has been adequately framed um, over the course of the past couple of days. Rashawn, if in fact um, there's kind of a us against them, uh, black versus white, affluent versus not so much, male versus female. How do we get beyond, if at all possible, that us versus them mentality that's pervasive throughout this country so that we really do come together as a united population? Um, I mean, I, I, I think that's always... A complicated question, um, you know, especially when you split along lines of 
you know, gender or, uh, or wealth. I mean, f from my perspective, part of the reason we are in the situation that we are in is because there hasn't been enough of an us against them from the perspective of dealing with white supremacy. And I'm not talking about the alt-right or neo-Nazis and skinheads, but I'm, I'm talking about a system and structure that is uh, that thrives off of capitalism and is sustained through militarism, and that it is a handful of individuals who benefit uh, from the system of white supremacy that even makes poor whites feel like people who are coming across the border to find employment because the U.S. has been involved in conflicts in their own country and destabilized their own country, see those immigrants uh, as the problem when in fact it's the people who have created the disturbance in those folks' native land uh, because of the military, uh, military industrial complex um, are the ones that we need to, to focus on. And I mean, there's a lot of conversations about uh, intersectionality and recognizing the experience uh, of various points of oppression uh, and how they are all embodied in uh, at multiple times in one individuals. And so like the experience of black women, right? They are black and they carry the burden of blackness, but they also carry the burden of being a woman. And it adds another level of uh, oppression to, to the experience of black women. And then when you layer on top of that, if it is a black woman who was queer, right? And so, um, but, but the, the, the penultimate oppressor in this is the structure and system of white supremacy. Um, and so I think the more that there are dialogues, the more that there are conversation, the more that there is appealing back and some uh, of, of the veil that kind of hides our understanding or obscures our understanding uh, of white supremacy, the better off we are. Uh, in the seven minutes that we have left, what I'd like to do, I'm going to ask uh, one or two more questions and I'll ask for a, a, a concise answer and then um, want to throw it back to the congressman to wrap this all up. Michael, from your perch in healthcare. Can you touch on, particularly with this epidemic raging throughout the globe, um, the impact, and we know the impact that it's having on folk of color, but can you just touch on what's going on in the healthcare world around uh, not everyone not having access to healthcare or, or health insurance? Let me go, then let, let, me, let, me, let me shift then uh, kind of real quick, man. You're messing up my line of people. Earbuds. You know? <laughs> Did you catch that, Mike? <laughs> You're on mute, Mike. No, okay, he can't hear. Right. Okay. Uh, so, 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 listen. Um, just uh, real briefly, um, Rashawn, you have any closing comments on today? We have like less than five minutes. You have any comments? Yeah, I'll just be brief again. I'm just thankful for the opportunity to have this conversation. I think there is again revisiting my earlier remarks that there is a real need to reconcile with this nation's history and begin some deep truth telling, but also work to vision a world that does not rely on the same systems and structures of oppression uh, that have kept us down. And we can begin with the carceral infrastructure and the criminal legal system to put us in a better position to do that. But I think these these conversations are important in moving us in that direction. Mike, are you back? In your yeah, I apologize. I lost the sound for a second. Yeah. Uh, any closing comment? We only have a couple of minutes left. Uh, any any comment? Closing yeah. Comment? You know, you know, I always, uh, you know, I love and I again reference Mahmoud El Khadi, who's on the ground, uh, professor in Minnesota. But he he instilled a lot of things in his proverbs, quotes, history. There's two quotes that he always beat in our heads, which is. A uh, power can seize nothing w without a demand. It never did. It never will. I mean, never. It never did. It never will. Ultimately, this is about uh, a strategy that includes policy changes. That includes uh, moving an agenda around body cameras, civilian review, all the stuff that Rasan works on on a daily basis. We need to get behind that agenda, and we need to move it. The other one is a W.E.B. Du Bois quote that says, "Nothing can be solved that can't be faced." America has not been willing to face 
white supremacy, institutional racism, its history. And we have to have all of us, including our allies, demand that recognition and that conversation, that family gathering conversation. And we need the congressmen, we need Biden, we need at every level people demanding that we have an honest, unfiltered, uh, delicate, <laughs> it'll make people uncomfortable, but it's a necessary conversation. Congressman, before I come to you, I'd ask you to fold your closing comment, I mean, your, your, your closing thoughts into your final comment. I'm going to go to Jaquetta, and then I've got a real quick question, and then we're going to go to you, Congressman. Uh, Jaquetta, any I, I, I just want the three of you to be safe. That's it. So just go out there and know that I already think you're dope. Just go out there and be safe. That's it. Okay. Uh, one quick last question, quick answer, and then we're going to go to the Congressman. Uh, so, Rashawn, if you were a superhero, who would you be, brother? Luke Cage. Luke Cage. <laughs> Sweet Christmas. <laughs> Michael, if you were a superhero, who would you be, brother? I would say just because of the, sign, the times we're in, it would be a position. Because <laughs> I, I love that image of all the superheroes lining the hallway and the physicians walking down the middle, and they're all taking a bow to the physician. We just realized today how much of a hero they are. Jaquetta, if you were a superhero, who would you be? I'd be um, Pam Greer's character, Coffee. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Congress, I mean, if you were a superhero, who would you be? Oh, man. Um, well, if you had a superpower, who would you be? If I had a superpower? Yeah. Man, um, knowledge, right? At this point, my to talk about it, but knowledge. Um, listen, I, I just wanted to build off of what Rasan said a second ago. Um, I think one of the one of the responsibilities that obviously elected officials have is to facilitate this conversation, um, and that's one that clearly our elected officials have not been sufficient at generating or or holding our own um, society accountable with. Um, but I also think that. Um, we've seen some powerful messaging offering false choice after false choice after false choice and actually benefiting from creating this conflict in our country. Um, and our responsibility in this, our country succeeds when we are able to recognize that in those differences come strength, not fear. Um, and ultimately it's on us, it's on leadership and it's on um, comes from that obligation to actually uh, to seek to unify a country behind that common future rather than a divided past. Um, and the only thing I, I thought of, Rosanna, and I'm not sure if you intended it when you were mentioning it, but um, I, I know you have a, a, a back a, a, a religious training as well. And I, I kept thinking that that was, that formulation is actually the core of so many of our faiths, right? The uniting, the thing that unites them, right? One of my favorite, it's not a strictly biblical text, but the prayer of St. Francis. Um, right? God grants so, not so much that I, uh, not so much to understand, to uh, be understood as to understand, um, right? To, to truly, uh, you know, to actually be a better member of community, to try to uh, understand better uh, those around us. Um, and if not now, and if not what we're see seeing it through this, um, and I think it's frustrating from my perspective to see how many different times and how many different ways we actually literally preach those lessons. But then when it comes back to this last taboo, we ignore them and we forget them. Um, and so, um, I am so grateful to uh, all of you for making time to have this conversation today. Um, I recognize that for all of you, you've had uh, this conversation far too many times um, and that we asked you to have it again. I'm grateful for it. I know that you will have it many times more and I am heartbroken for that. Um, I, um, I'll finish by saying I got a, a message from a friend yesterday um, who's got, um, I think, uh, two little boys. Um, and um, he's black, his wife is white. And he said it was the first time that he had to sit down and have a conversation with him, um, a conversation that I will never have with my family. Uh, I 
conversation I'm sure Mr. Curry uh, has had with his three boys in his car right now. Um, and I just hope that one day we don't have to have that conversation. Um, the fact that I don't have to, and the fact that the guy that was one year older from me in college, same educational institution, same education, extremely successful, but that there is a different fear that takes place in him and a different conversation that he has to have with his young children that I don't. Um, I'm grateful for all that you are doing to make sure we don't have to have that continue. So. Thank you, Congressman. I want to thank you, Rashawn, Jaqueta, Michael. Um, this has been a very spirited conversation, one that's going to continue. And just to close it out, I'll say that if I were a superhero, I would be Shaft because he was a bad mother. <laughs> Hey, be safe out there down the road. Thank you so much. Hey, hey, Sheriff, thank you for all you're doing in the, in the criminal justice space, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Be well. Thank you. Thank you.